Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'll, I'll get back there in just a sound in just a second. Thank you so much for being here tonight for our last installment of our uh, World Religions class. Um, and uh, we're delighted that uh, uh, Imam Fahad Taslim is here with us from the uh, Islamic Outreach Center in, uh, in Cyprus. And uh, he's here to uh, speak with us for a while, do a presentation, and then we'll uh, entertain some questions. So, and you can mix up questions in the presentation if you want to. And, and uh, as we get closer to uh, 8.30, if we go that long, I'll sort of call for the final question. Sure. start in a traditional way, we start off by saying, and you're not going to understand this, but it's Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulih al-Kareem, amma ba'd. And basically translate that, you guys don't mind if I walk around, right? I don't, I don't like being, okay. So basically to translate that, basically that just means that I start in the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful, uh, and all praises and all glory be to God, and peace and blessings upon his messenger, Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon So that's just an introduction of how we generally start. Um, so before I get into exactly what is Islam and all of the you know uh, information that I have to share with you, um, I wanted to tell you about a. All right. I wanted to tell you about a uh, certain scholar in the uh, in the Islamic world lived a long time ago, and um, what happened was that one day there was a, a husband and a wife, and they got into this this argument. And the husband got upset, and the wife, she just wasn't talking to her husband. And this was making the husband really, really upset. So he's, you know, he gets mad, and he tells her, he goes, look, if you don't talk to me, I swear to God, and you know, I swear to God, I'm not going to talk to you until you talk to me. And then she says, well, you know what? I swear to God that if you don't talk to me, I'm not going to talk to you. Now, one of the things that I guess you have, one of the things we should understand about Islamic law is that an oath is a really big deal, like a really big deal. If you say in Arabic, it's wallah, by God, I won't do this, it means, you know, that's it. Uh, you're going to be held accountable for that. So the next morning he gets up and obviously what happens, things have cooled down and he's thinking, wow, I just took an oath and I'm not going to speak to my wife uh, and she hasn't spoken to me, so this is a big problem. Um, so he goes to the various scholars of the city and the scholar basically tells him, one, you know, he goes to one or the other, they say, look, you just got to, you know, you just got to repent and you got to ask God for forgiveness and that's it. That's the only way out. So he's kind of upset, you know, that's not the answer he really wanted. But he wants to go to one particular scholar that's known in the city. And his name was Imam Abu Hanifa. Um, he's known to be quite brilliant, actually. So he goes to Imam Abu Hanifa and he tells him, look, this is my situation. And so the scholar, Imam Abu Hanifa, listened to him. He said, okay. He goes, so there's no problem. Just go home and talk to your wife. <laughs> and he's like, really? No repentance? He's like, no, no, there's no repentance. Don't worry about it. Just go home. You don't have to ask for forgiveness. Just go home and talk to her. So he's elated, right? He's on his way home, walking down. He's like, this is great. So he runs into the other scholar that he had asked. And the other scholar tells him, or asks him, he said, hey, what did Imam Abu Hanifa tell you? So he said, well, he said I can just go home and talk to my wife and everything's good. So he was like, what? He's like, no, 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 that can't be right. Come with me. Come, let's go. So they go back to the house of Imam Abu Hanifa, and they, you know, he storms in, the scholar storms in and says, Imam Abu Hanifa, what have you told this man? Don't you fear God? And so he says, well, why? What's the problem? He said, didn't you hear what he said? So Imam Abu Hanifa said, didn't you hear what he said? He says, what are you talking about? He goes, tell the guy. He goes, okay, tell me again what happened. He says, well, I had, I had an argument with my wife. I said, by God, I'm not going to talk to you until you talk to me. And she said, well, by God, I'm not going to talk to you until you talk to me. So Imam Abu Hanifa says, yeah, what's the problem? So the scholar says, what? Explain yourself. He says, look, 
He made an oath. He says, by God, wallahi, I'm not going to talk to you until you talk to me. And she said to him, talking to him, saying, I'm not going to talk to you until you talk to me. Bam, oath's done. <laughs> so, so my point really with that was kind of, a, well, number one, it was an icebreaker. But number two, one of the things, especially when it comes to a religion like Islam, there's a lot of, a lot of preconceived notions that people have, especially with the media and everything else. And things aren't always what they seem. And so one of the first things I usually like to do when I give a presentation is to ask everyone to kind of, if there are some preconceived notions, just for a little while to put them on the side, right? And to, you know, to try to think with a blank slate, as they say. Um, that's, uh, that's usually how I like to start these type of presentations. Okay, so now, getting to what is Islam. Uh, the first place I like to start when it comes to Islam and I'm kind of, uh, I like linguistics a lot, which bores the heck out of my wife. Um, and she always tells me, don't get into linguistics, you're gonna bore people. But I'm gonna do it anyway. Okay, so Islam, the word Islam, you know, a lot of times you'll hear people that say, well, Islam means peace. Has anyone ever heard that? Maybe, you probably have, I'm, just, I'm okay. Um, that's not quite right. So I'm, I'm here to kind of elucidate that a little bit. Islam, um, it has a number of different derivatives. So one derivative is it means submission. In other words, it's submitting one's total self onto God. So that's one meaning, al-Islam, al-Istislam. That, that's, what, that's what the meaning comes from. The second meaning is obedience. In other words, whatever God commands, you're obedient to that. The third meaning is uh, sincerity. In other words, all of the actions that you're doing, they're sincerely, purely, with a pure intention, solely for the sake of God. And then the fourth definition is peace. So after you do all of that, you submit, you surrender yourself, you're obedient, and you're sincere with that, then you enter a state of peace with the creator of the heavens and the earth. So that's what Islam linguistically means. Now, let me also, while I'm on the topic of Islam, I'll tell you what a Muslim is as well. And Muslims, um, you know, I'm sure you, perhaps you've met some Muslims and so on and so forth, but I'm gonna, again, I'm going to go down the linguistic path and bear with me just for a few minutes. So in Arabic, any time you have like a doer of an action, um, in English what would you do is you would add an ER to the end of the word, right? So you have a drive, and someone that drives is a driver, someone who, uh, I don't know, stink is a stinker, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> All right, so you get the point. In Arabic, what you would do is you would add, I guess the English equivalent would be an MU, to the beginning of the word, okay? So I'll give you an example. So someone that travels, the word for traveling is suffer. And by the way, the English word for safari comes from the same word. So someone that travels, suffer, uh, you know you would suffer a lot when you travel. Anyways, um, so the word for suffer is, is traveling. Someone that travels is a moon suffer or a musafir, okay? Um, similarly, the one that calls the prayer, there's a call to prayer that we make five times a day, it's, it's the adhan. And someone that does the adhan is a mu adhan or a muadhan. Okay, so someone that does Islam, someone that submits, surrenders, is sincere in that submission and that surrender, is a mu Islam or a Muslim. Okay, so, um, so that's what a Muslim is. And so by extension, one of the core beliefs that we have, and I'll, I'll touch on this a little, with a little more detail later on, is that every single prophet that walked the face of the earth was a Muslim. But not Muslim on, in the sense of what you see on TV, right? Muslim in what I just told you, that they were sincere, they were obedient to God, they surrendered themselves to God, and therefore when, when, when you hear a Muslim say, well, we believe all the prophets were Muslims, you know, initially, that might seem a little offensive, like, hey, what do you mean? You're trying to say they're like those guys on the TV that you know, do God's what? <laughs> Anyways, so no, that's not what we're talking about. We're saying that they were sincere people, obedient people, and they were people that surrendered their entire will to the will of God. So whether we're talking about Moses, or Adam, or Noah, or Jesus, or any prophet that, that, were, you know, that are well-known, biblically as well, uh, we say that they were, they were Muslims, based on this definition. Okay. So that's kind of a little bit of the linguistic side, um, and hopefully it didn't last too long. 
Uh, I'll move on now uh, to, I was thinking about, okay, how am I going to put this presentation together? How should I organize it? And then I realized that within our tradition, there is a, uh, a, a what they call hadith. Hadith are sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, and basically, this hadith actually gives us a nice breakdown of what Islam is. And I'll give you the background to it. So one day, the Prophet Muhammad, and I'll, and I'll get to who he was in a little bit, the Prophet Muhammad was sitting down, and he was sitting with some of his companions. Um, and this man walks in. Now, when this man walks in, he comes and, you know, you can imagine the Prophet is, is sitting down like this. Uh, and he comes in, oops, he comes in, walks right in, walks past everybody, <coughs> sits down, and basically sits in front of him knee to knee. Now, the rest of the companions and the narrator who is, who is giving us this, this description is telling us that this was very odd. Number one, this is a prophet of God. This, this is what we believe. And to come up and just cut through everyone and just sit right in front of him, knee to knee, uh, was a little, you know, a little uncouth. So, you know, the narrator says, but what was really strange was that he wasn't, he wasn't from the city. The, the city that they lived in, it was a small city, and so everyone kind of knew everyone. It was like a, like a small town. So we didn't recognize him. And he didn't have the signs of travel, because this is, you're talking about the middle of the desert. If someone's traveling, they're going to have dusty hair and clothes that are, you know, full of dirt. As I said, he had, you know, you know, black hair, no dirt, nothing. So he comes in, and he sits right in front of the Prophet Muhammad, and he asks him a question. And he says to him, Ya Muhammad, akhbarni anna islam Oh Muhammad, tell me what is Islam? And so the Prophet Muhammad then starts to tell him, and by extension, telling us what Islam exactly is. And he starts off, he says, Islam, and there's actually five things. How to make these words, five fingers, five things. So Islam, the first thing, Islam is, and he said, Al-Tashadu an la ilaha illallah wa Muhammad Rasulullah. That is, Islam is to testify that there is nothing worthy of worship except God. And to testify that Muhammad is the messenger of God, like Jesus was a messenger of God, like Noah was a messenger of God, like Moses was a messenger of God. This is the first, you could say, pillar of Islam, is to make this testimony. So when a person recognizes this idea of worshiping, or worshiping, you know, that, that my worship should be purely for the sake of God, and they testify to that, that's the first, you could say, entry into Islam. That's how one becomes a Muslim. And, and just on a side note, um, that entry includes believing in Jesus and Moses and John the Baptist and all of them. If someone doesn't believe in them, they can't be a Muslim. And that goes by extension of what's known as the Shahada or the testimony of faith. So the first thing that he said, what is Islam? It's to testify that there's nothing worthy of worship except the creator of the heavens and the earth and that Muhammad, just like as I mentioned, Moses, Jesus, John the Baptist, etc., are all messengers of God. So that's the first thing. Now, the second thing he said is the prayer, as salah. And perhaps you may have seen Muslims pray. Uh, it's a very distinct way in which it's done. Uh, we start off standing, and you know, we have this we raise our hand and say, Allah Akbar, which means God is great. Then we have a bowing position, and then we go into prostration. Um, and the prayer. Just to uh, kind of get into that a little bit, the prayer, uh, we pray five times a day. And that might seem like a lot, but believe it or not, traditions tell us that originally, the original commandment was to pray 50 times a day. <laughs> so, and it really goes back to what Muslims believe is the purpose of life. The purpose of life, what we say is, it is to worship God. That's why we created and, and that's And so, if the purpose of life is to worship God, even if you had spent 50 prayers a day, if that's your purpose, well and good. But uh, the, the narr narrations tell us that actually where the prayer was instituted was when Muhammad, peace be upon him, went to visit God. Okay? And he went to him and God said, you, you know, you need to pray 50 times a day. You and your nation need to pray 50 times a day. So he comes down off of one heaven and meets Moses. And Moses tells him, he said, 50 times a day? Look, I have experience with Bani Israel. I have experience with the children of Israel. They won't be able to handle 50 times a day. You need to get that decreased. 
So he goes back, and, he, and then God decreases it by five. He goes back and says, 45. He says, nope, 45 is not going to work. That's not going to fly. Trust me, I have experience. It's not going to work. So this, goes, this continues going on until it comes down to five. And believe it or not, Moses said at that point as well, five is too much. But the prophet Muhammad said, I'm too embarrassed to go back. At that point, God said, five prayers, but they're equal to 50. So when you pray five times a day for the Muslims, that's equal to 50 prayers a day. Uh, so anyhow, so we pray five times a day, and the prayer basically it's at, uh, at uh, before a little bit before sunrise. That's the first one. It's called Fajr. The second one is at noon time, around noon, uh, and that's called Dhuhr. The third one is around the afternoon. That's called Asr. The fourth one is Maghrib. This is what I was just praying, and then I gunned it over here. Uh, that's Maghrib. And then the fifth one is a night prayer, which is Al Isha, and so that probably has come in now. So it's five prayers a day. Um, and there, it's not as limiting as you might think it is. So it's not like, okay, five o'clock, boom, you gotta pray. You have, you know, you have a window. Uh, you know, some windows are a little shorter, so the sunset prayer is a little shorter because you have to make sure you pray before the sun actually uh, goes below the, the horizon. Similarly with the sunrise prayer, you have to kind of make sure you pray before the sun rises. So those are a little limited, but the other ones, there's a little more room, and so you have that, um, that freedom. So that's the prayer. Um, one of the things I can tell you just as a personal benefit is five times a day, you know, in the hustle bustle of things, uh, one of the things that I do, I'm, aside from being an imam, I'm also an accountant, and specifically I'm a tax accountant. And so you can imagine between now and April 15th, I'm going to be pulling my hair out, especially on the 14th when a whole bunch of people walk in and give me the shoe boxes. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so but one, of the things that, one of the things that the prayer does is that five times a day, I get to cut myself off from all of my work, you know, my kids, whatever it may be, and just remind myself, why do I exist? It's to connect with God and to be here to serve God. Um, and so that, you know, just on a, on, a, on a personal level, personal experience, it really does help one keep that connection with God. And the fact that it is as frequent as it is, um, it really does help in that regard. So I kind of see the benefits spiritually having those five prayers a day. Okay, so that's the second pillar. So we said the first one was a testimony. The second one is the prayer. The third one is what's known as a zagat or zagat. Um, the, and I'll get into a little bit of linguistics because, like I said, I like it a lot. Zakah means to purify something. So when you come to the, the Qur'an, which is the book of the Muslims, one of the things you'll see is this word zakah is, is used when you're talking about purifying something. So in one passage in the Qur'an it says that the prophets and messengers uh, were sent to use him, which means to purify them, meaning that they were sent to the people to call them to God but also to purify their souls. Now what zakat means, and it's by extension, this is a purification of one's wealth. <clears throat> so the idea now is that you have uh, wealth that you've accumulated right, over time, and it's kind of like, in, term, in, in tax terminology, it's like a savings tax. So you start at the beginning of the year, you look at the end of the year, if you have some savings, you'll take 2.5% of that and pay that to the poor and the impoverished. And that is, again, using contemporary terminology, it's earmarked. Meaning it's, there's eight categories of people that I can go to. So it has to be the poor and the impoverished. It has to be to the wayfarer, the one who's traveling, who's, who's lost. Uh, someone that, uh, you know, that, there's eight, eight, eight categories, which is earmarked. One is the person that collects the zakat, but it can't go to anyone else. And those, all those eight categories are people that are poor, impoverished, or in trouble. Now, the relation between coming back to zakat and wealth is that when you give that wealth, you know, you spend all of this time, all this effort making this money, and you, in, in, in the Islamic framework, uh, there's this idea of having pure wealth in the sense you earned it correctly versus wealth that you perhaps may not have earned correctly, right? And what we say is that you can't really guarantee that every single transaction you've done has been 100% correct and has been 100% just. So in order to purify, purify yourself from any sort of guess, impurities, if you want to call it, uh, you pay zakat. And, and there is a de minimis, by the way. So it's not like that no matter, you know, even if you have $5 in the bank and you have to pay 2.5% of that, there's a minimum level. So you do have this idea of, you know, you, you have your, your home expenses. I'm about to get into some tax terminology, so I need to stop myself. So I was about to say deductions, anyways. 
So you have that which you, you need to live with, right? So your house and your car and things like that aren't included. After that, if you have some savings over one year, 2.5% of that goes to help the poor and the impoverished. So that's the, the third pillar. Uh, next, he says, the Prophet Muhammad, when he's explaining Islam, he says, Antasumu fi Ramadan, fi shahr Ramadan. And that is to fast the month of Ramadan. Now you might think, and I get this a lot, and people come to me and say, so you fast for the entire month? <laughs> and usually it stems from when I tell them, well, you're not supposed to eat or drink anything, and you're not supposed to have any sort of relations with your spouse. And they say, you do that for a month? And I say, uh, yeah, this is for a whole month? I was like, yeah. It's like, you're still alive? <laughs> I said, well, no, it's not, it's not quite like that. It's basically you eschew from you know, uh, food and drink and relations with your spouse from sunup to sundown. After sun is down, then you can, you know, eat and drink and, you know, etc. Um, to, you know, your heart's content, <laughs> right? But the point is, is those daytime hours in which you do it. And this is for this goes on for a whole month. The month in Islam is calculated on a lunar basis. By the way, that's why I have all these phases of the moon up there. And so, one of the things that if you have Muslim friends or something like that, you'll notice that the month of Ramadan shifts every year, right? So it's not like, oh, it'll be, you know, it'll be. December every year. That doesn't work like that. Uh, basically, in one's lifetime, you'll fast winter days, which are super easy, right? It's like five hours or something like that. So no, it's not that bad. But I mean, like six, seven, eight hours, really easy. And then you'll have summer fasts because it's changing, right? So then you have those long, like 12, 15 hour fasts. And those, are, those are brutal. Um, so the, the idea is that that month kind of shifts throughout the year and you fast. Uh, one of the benefits that, that we get from fasting is, and one of the benefits it's, it's supposed to give, as is mentioned in the Quran, is to increase what's known as taqwa. And taqwa is meaning like this God consciousness, or, you know, reminding yourself about God, and also reminding yourself that as bad as you think your situation is, remember, there's people out there that have it worse, and people that don't have enough food. Right? I mean, you may, you, know, you, may, you may not have a lot, even when you break your fast, but at least you have something to break your fast with at the end. Um, and I think that, you know, especially um, in the United States, you know, you remember John F. Kennedy, he had that big, that, that statement where he said, you know, we live in a country that has 50% of the world's wealth, half of the world's wealth, and we are 7% of the world's population. So we're blessed, Absolutely. we're very blessed. And this kind of, you know, kind of takes us back and, and, you know, at least for me, it kind of humbles a person, right, to, rem to remind ourselves that there's people out there that are doing much worse than us. And so, we, you know, we should be thankful for that, for what we do have. Uh, so in this month, what you'll find is that Muslims tend to increase in their charity a lot because they're reminded of that. And they have night prayers as well. So if you ever go to the mosque in Ramadan, uh, it's jam-packed. Uh, and if you think that's the way it is year-round, I wish... <laughs> <But it's not. laughs> so that, that's why I usually tell people, I say, you know, if you call someone from a church group or something, call them from Ramadan. Get him in here. You know, see his pack, and that's not how it is during the year. But anyhow, so that's the, the, the fasting Ramadan. Um, the, the fifth pillar, or the fifth thing that, that the Prophet Muhammad mentioned, he says, and that it's to, it's to travel to Mecca to make Hajj uh, if you have the means to do so. So what is Hajj? Well, first of all, it's traveling to Mecca in current day Saudi Arabia. And there, and, I, and there's a picture there as well, there's a, a box-like structure. Does this thing work? Yeah, there's a box-like structure, which is known as the Kaaba. And the word Kaaba means cube in Arabic, or box in Arabic. And the basis for that is that um, what we see, and there may be some biblical references to this as well, was that uh, Abraham, uh, had a son by the name of, uh, in Arabic, it's Ismail, in English, it's Ishmael. And what happened was, was that he, by the order of God, this, uh, you know, went out to the desert and left him and his mother, Hajar, in, in Arabic, I believe maybe it's Hagar in English, I might have that wrong. Uh, so he, and so Abraham leaves them in the desert by the order of God. And he's walking away, and, and Hajar, I'm going to go with Arabic, no, fine. So Hajar says, you know, where are you leaving us? Where are you? There's nothing around. You're going to leave us here in the middle of nowhere? And he's walking. He doesn't say anything. 
And then she says, she says, did God order you to do this? And he says, yes. And she says, well, if God ordered you to do it, then I'm content with whatever the order of God is. So now she's there, and she and she and there's two hills. And she has young Ismail or Ishmael, this little baby infant, and she's running between two hills. And these hills are known as Safa and Marwa. And when she's running between the two hills, uh, what happens is, is that as she's running, the 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 foot of Ismail kicks the ground and water springs forth. <laughs> And this water actually flows till today in Mecca. It's known as the Well of Zamzam. Uh, and, and you go there, and one of the things that you do when you go for Hajj is drink from that water and run on those hills in honor of, in, of Hajj. So that's one ritual. But then, as uh, Ismail, <clears throat> as Ishmael grows up, um, God orders Abraham, Ishmael, to rebuild the house of worship. And the belief is, one second, let me just, sorry about that. And the belief is, is that that original house of worship, the Kaaba, was originally built by Adam. And over time, it was corrupted and destroyed, so now, Abraham has been ordered to rebuild the house along with his son, Ishmael, who we, who we also believe is a prophet. And so they build it. And then God says, call the people. And Abraham is, is looking around. He's in the middle of the desert. He's like, who's going to come? <laughs> right? There's nobody here. So God says, you call the people, and I'll make sure that they come. And so today, when we go to this place, every year we have about between two to four million people. And their only objective of going there is to fulfill this pillar of worship, which is known as the Hajj. And when they get there, the thing that they're reciting is in Arabic, it's La Bayt Allahumma La Bayt, which means, oh God, here I am answering that call. That call that Abraham made, here I am to answer that call. So anyhow, so that's the background with Hajj. And so the, la the fifth and last pillar of Islam, or, or of the meaning of Islam, is to make that hajj, make that pilgrimage once in your lifetime. It's not something you have to do you know, every year, if you can afford to do so, and if you're physically capable of doing so. And I can tell you, you know, we, uh, my wife and I, you know, God bless us with the opportunity to actually go for hajj, and it is just, it's, it's really amazing. I mean, you see people from all over the world, you know, people from Australia and England, you know, all over Africa, Indonesia, and the one thing that everyone is saying is, Nabayk Allahumma Nabayk, here we are, God, answering your call. Uh, and there's a special type of clothing you wear as well, it's just two sheets, and everyone's there wearing two sheets. It doesn't matter if you're a king or a prince or a pauper, or, you know, whatever you do, but everyone's at one level. I'll tell you what's really phenomenal is, you know, you have two to four million people here, right? And um, I don't know, what's, uh, uh, Reliance Stadium. How many? How, how many? How many fit in the Reliance Stadium? Anyone know? Seventy-five thousand. Right. Uh, I want you to. I want you to picture with me for a second. If you told all seventy-five thousand people, look, I want you to get up and move four chairs over. How easy would that be? <laughs> it would be really difficult, right? Okay. With two to four million people there, um, when the call to prayer comes you will find that everyone automatically arranges themselves and faces the Kaaba and starts the prayer. And there's no, there's no guidance, there's no one with a, you know, with, a, with a mic saying, all right, get in the line, do this, get in the right hand, you move on, nothing. Everyone lines up, and what you see there is that, you know, that, that's actually the people, but you'll see certain pictures, if you ever do like Google search, where you see these circles around the Kaaba, okay? Like, it's like a satellite picture. And what that is, is that's people that have lined up around the Kaaba, and this is, you're talking about a few minutes. It's not like you have like an hour to organize yourself. So everyone lines up, and, and this is how it is, like through the entire city. So you're seeing the area inside, the, inside around the Kaaba, but entire, entire city, the shopkeepers come out and they just, boom, start praying, you know? And everyone's kind of lined up. So I thought that was really remarkable uh, with my experience on, on, the, on the Hajj. Um, so, now, so that's basically what Islam is in general. How are we doing on time? We're good. We're good. Okay. Um, 
Does anyone have any questions?